Close encounters of the third kind are the ultimate proof that they are here. However, more often than not, witnesses to these encounters are ridiculed, shamed, and suffer in silence. Media outlets have sometimes contributed to sensationalism or debunked UFO stories, impacting public belief and skepticism. Like it's starting to be covered on mainstream news, but you know, you can always tell when the story is coming because the, the, the news person starts to snicker. And it's like, when, when are they going to take this seriously? Although 20,000 witnesses simultaneously saw the Phoenix Lights UAP, more than 25 years later, it's just another YouTube video. Decades of disclosures and denials. Today, we make contact with those who have made the ultimate contact. Stories of close encounters, so invasive and terrifying. They, they had tubes that they attached to the top of my chest. And the unimaginable. And I said, I have a baby and they want it. And all of a sudden, my legs went apart and nothing was touching them. These are the alien disclosure files. The 1972 book by J. Allen Hynek titled The UFO Experience, A Scientific Inquiry, established three distinct categories for close encounters with alien life. Close encounters of the first kind, also known as CE-1, are visual sightings of an unidentified flying object, seemingly less than 500 feet or 150 meters away, that show an appreciable angular extension and considerable detail. I witnessed a UFO in broad daylight. Close Encounters of the Second Kind, or CE2, is a UFO event in which a physical effect is alleged. This can be interference in the functioning of a vehicle or electronic device, animals reacting, a psychological effect such as paralysis, or heat and discomfort in the witness, or some physical trance, like impressions in the ground, scorched or otherwise affected vegetation or a chemical trace. So I'm lying there relaxed and I start realizing I can't move my hands. I can't move my feet, I can't move my legs. And finally, close encounters of the third kind, or CE3, are UFO encounters in which an animated entity is present. These include humanoids, robots, and humans who seem to be occupants or pilots of a UFO. They had their long arms down like this, and they had the big black wraparound eyes. Science fiction literature and films have contributed to the cultural fascination of UFOs and alien encounters, often shaping public perception. The number of reported alien abductions is difficult to quantify accurately because these reports often rely on personal testimonies and may not be accurately documented. Additionally, many UFO and abduction reports remain unverified and are often met with skepticism from the scientific and mainstream communities. Many UFO and alien abduction stories can be attributed to natural phenomena, misidentifications, psychological factors, or hoaxes. Physiological factors such as sleep paralysis are a relatively common phenomenon in which someone experiences a state of immobility just before falling asleep or upon awakening or better explained by Dr. Balan Jalal's lecture at Oxford University. So sleep paralysis might be one of the most interesting uh, phenomena in the entirety of, uh, of, of medicine, if not science. I mean, here you have this condition where you're lying in your, be in your bed, suddenly you might realize, my God, am I awake? I feel like I'm awake, but I'm, enti I'm entirely paralyzed. I cannot move, I cannot speak, right? And you might have this feeling of an intruder in your bedroom approaching your body, you know, choking you, strangling you, okay, even potentially sexually violating you, okay, that's, that occurs pretty commonly. The search for the truth has a broad range of factors to consider. As convincing as the correlations may be with extraterrestrial life, we must always consider the unexplained as well. Survivors of these events live somewhere between science 
and the supernatural. I wonder how much of this is physical, like they're, you're literally not in the bed, where there is a witness of someone being lifted, or they're missing, they're not in the house. Um, I wonder how much of it is physical and how much of it is astral. Scientific investigations and research continue in the field of astrobiology and the search for extraterrestrial life. But concrete evidence of such encounters has not been confirmed to date. But one thing is certain, there are people who claim that we should be looking for more than some rocks from the heavens. The U.S. government has confirmed UAPs caught on radar, but what about close encounters of the first kind by thousands of people at the same time? I got four of them. Major sighting here. The Phoenix Lights UFO incident, also known as the Phoenix Lights, refers to a series of widely witnessed and unexplained lights seen over the skies of Arizona, particularly the Phoenix metropolitan area, on the evening of March 13, 1997. It remains one of the most famous and well-documented UFO sightings in recent history. This was a close encounter of the first kind, witnessed by thousands. Maybe a half a dozen, to my recollection, lights that just hung in the air, didn't move. They definitely were not airplanes. You couldn't even hear the wind. It was so quiet. It was just, it just didn't even do anything. It just came through. Video doesn't do it justice. In real life, they're huge. They're amber. There's no flaring. Tens of thousands of people witnessed the same occurrence on the same night where a V shape of lights hovered over Phoenix. And then Five Simonton, the governor at the time, the next day, he had a, uh, a meeting, uh, a press conference. And he was saying, oh, it's nothing, you know, we, it, it's just weather balloons. And he had another gentleman who was in a huge uh, head shaped like an alien. And of course, everybody laughed it off. Don't get him too close to me, please. <laughs> Many years later, Five Samington had an interview where he said, I know what I saw. I was told not to say this, but at the time, I saw a spaceship the size of a football field with a V-shaped formation of light, a single craft hovering over me with no sound and no emission. And he said, by far, it was the most magnificent thing I've seen in my life. Well, I saw a, uh, a huge craft just kind of come right over Squaw Peak um, that was, you know, it was just breathtaking. with phone calls after people spotted a hovering circular unidentified flying object over Manhattan. Hundreds saw it. It was recorded on video. October 14th, 2010, New York City. One of the most populated cities in the world was the site where hundreds witnessed a UAP simultaneously. This UAP remains unconfirmed. Sheriff Deputy Val Johnson was on patrol when he saw bright lights hovering on the road ahead when the lights exploded toward his squad car, causing damage to his car, burns on his body, and his watch stopped for 14 minutes. This is the big thing that they come to see from all over the United States. People have come to see this car. Whatever hit him started with a broken headlight, and up here, there is a weird dent right in the top of the hood. Broke the windshield, hit the reflector, and bent both of the antenna. When they found him, his watch and the car had stopped for 14 minutes. If surviving a close encounter of the second kind wasn't terrifying enough, imagine being asleep in bed while being abducted by aliens on an astral plane. Meet Camille, who shares her close encounter of the third kind. A 
Close Encounter of the Third Kind, or CE3, contact. Two of our three witnesses, Camille, James Harmon, and Earl Gray Anderson, have had CE3 experiences, while UAP witness Travis Hinson has had 30 years of silent suffering, being visited by multiple UAPs, all as CE1 encounters. The prevalence of abduction claims has varied over time and by location. During the height of the UFO abduction narratives in the 1980s and 90s, there were numerous reported cases, and these cases received substantial media attention. But it's essential to know that not all UFO sightings or encounters with extraterrestrial beings are classified as abductions. They, they had tubes that they attached to the top of my chest. And I think, I, I believe that they were probably also to my legs, but I, I couldn't really see down there. I couldn't move my head. I just moved my eyes. I was starting to get scared at this point. Looked up in the sky and plain as day, as if somebody had actually painted it onto the Carolina blue sky, was a saucer shaped craft, um, silver with a row of lights going down the middle of it. Now, all the lights were going on and off in different colors. Perhaps Earth is a Petri dish, and we have been down here as some type of experiment. And on occasion, extraterrestrials come down similarly, like when we go into the Serengeti and we tag lions and we drug them, tag them, examine them, weigh them, check their teeth, and then let them go. I wonder if that's happening with alien abductions. I started having all this anxiety and all these weird physical symptoms, and I noticed that I didn't have a menstrual cycle from September, like going on several months, and that was unusual. Some researchers argue that many abduction accounts can be attributed to sleep disorders psychological phenomena or other non-alien explanations. I had this experience while sleeping of having sleep paralysis twice in one night. And I had had that before in my life, like very, very occasionally, where you wake up frozen in your body and you can't move and you can't talk. And But this particular time in this frozen state, I heard a, I heard like a synthesized electronic voice say my name off to my left side while I was in this frozen state. It was like a column of light and it was this turquoisey blue and when it hit me I curled into a fetal position. That's how I remembered it. And I went like up, 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 like through the ceiling and I was, I was kind of panicking. And then the next thing I knew I was unfolded on a table and I was in a room that was very white misty light. So I don't know, I don't remember like seeing a spaceship, going into a spaceship or anything like that. Camille did not have her menstrual cycle for three months after seeing a UAP with her boyfriend. She has felt different since being abducted. Did she suddenly realize why she was there? And I said, I have a baby and they want it. And all of a sudden, my legs went apart and nothing was touching them. And that was terrifying because it was like, who is moving my legs? And then there was a being that appeared between my legs and I couldn't see this being. This being was blocked from my memory. But I saw a flash of an instrument. It was like a speculum, like a, like a gynecological tool that was very scary. And the next thing I knew, that thing was being put inside me and very quickly they took out the instrument and there was a very small piece of something in there and they walked out of the room with it. Encounters don't get any closer than what Camille experienced. And just when you thought that's more than any human being can handle, Camille's dentist discovered an implant that was not of this earth in her mouth. It appears that not only was something taken from Camille, but something was also left behind.
Camille's recollection of her abduction was not instantaneous. It took years to put the pieces of her incident back together. She would undergo regression therapy with a psychologist who assisted Camille in reliving the event. Camille didn't leave empty-handed. Her dentist discovered something unusual as well. And he gets to the point where he sees this spherical mass in my tooth that he says was not there before. He, he at one point stopped and he showed me with a mirror and he was banging on it with the little thing. And he's like, you see this? It's really, really hard and I'm drilling and drilling on it and it's barely moving it and I don't know what this is. This was not here before. It's not your old filling. It's not decay. And what do you want me to do? Camille's dentist took an x-ray and was so convinced of the anomaly that he wrote a letter detailing his finding. He finished the letter saying, quote, as to the nature of the spherical object, I am still unclear as to its nature. Earl Gray Anderson has appeared on several episodes of this series as a ufologist, and he is also the Southern California director for MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network. Unlike Camille's contact, Earl was performing a self-meditation in an attempt to manifest alien contact on an astral plane. His wife was present in their bed, sleeping next to him. Uh, and I tried this thing called CE5 meditation, and I sent out a, what I was hoping was a telepathic message. The whole, the whole idea behind a CE5 communication, which is a contact modality, is that you get into a meditative state and then you ask them to reveal themselves to you. For me, it was kind of a lark. I didn't think that it would work. I, I just kind of, why not? That was my whole attitude. And I was thinking, yeah, you know, maybe aliens will pick me up, give me the cosmic tour, you know? <laughs> what I thought at this point was maybe they're just going to desanguinate me. It just drain me of all my blood and I'll be like one of those cows that they find. And I, I realized, you know, maybe these aren't good guys, you know, it's not E.T. phone home, it's E.T., we want your blood. <laughs> and uh, so, but anyway, the, these tubes detached and they went, they went through the hole in the wall. I didn't see a machine that they were attached to. Again, it was just still just distance and white light coming that, that I could perceive. When you look into the black eyes, now these were the small little gray entities. And it's like looking into eternity. You really can't look away. Uh, there's something hypnotizing about their eyes themselves. During the C3 events that both Camille and Earl experienced, they had medical examinations, they saw non-human entities, and experienced telepathic communication. As for Camille, many of the events she experienced happened over years, and she didn't remember much until she sought a regression. A regression is when you go to someone who is a certified hypnotherapist who can put you in a relaxed hypnotic state and prompt you to examine a target and get more information about it. The regression made the events of Camille's abduction very clear, and she was able to piece together events that were blocked from her memory. She discovered that her dentist was not the only person examining the object in her mouth. So she puts me in the regression, targeting the tooth. And I come to, in the memory, I'm on a gurney or a table or something in this exam room, but it's not an alien exam room. And there's two guys in there. And they're humans. And they're wearing lab coats. And they have khaki pants. And they have black shoes. And all I know is this is different because in this memory, I don't feel, I don't feel paralyzed. I don't feel that terror of the creatures, right? I felt drugged. I felt very lethargic and barely conscious. And all I got from what these guys were doing was the word troublemaker. They were calling me a troublemaker. And the next thing I knew, they took a syringe and squirted something into my cheek through the outside, not in my mouth like that, but like through my cheek. And that was it. That's, that was the procedure that I recalled. 
Since J. Allen Hynek created the Close Encounter grades, there have been two extensions added. Hynek's former associate, Jacques Vallée, quote, cases where witnesses experienced a transformation of their sense of reality, end quote. To also include non-abduction cases where absurd, hallucinatory, or dreamlike events are associated with UFO encounters. As Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind was introduced by Dr. Stephen Greer, where in a CE5 event, individuals or groups use specific protocols to establish communication or interaction with extraterrestrial beings. These protocols primarily involve the use of contact meditation and use of sounds or signals. I feel like a bunch of information is about to come out. And I think more people should, should be speaking out about what they saw. There are more people out there that have seen things that aren't speaking up yet because of fear of being ridiculed and made fun of. And, you know, at this point, I'm like, you know, I, I don't really care anymore. Thank you to our brave guests on this program and to all of the brave witnesses not on this program who stepped forward and encouraged others to step forward. Soon, there will be an army of truth seekers. And someday soon, we won't need alien disclosure files because the truth will have been revealed.